Great, thanks, Tom. Hey, yeah, everyone, welcome back. Um, hope you had a good lecture this morning. So yeah, it, it's the, my last lecture today. Uh, so I guess yesterday we spoke about a number of things. We um, spoke about higher dimensional networks, describing higher dimensional states as well as lower dimensional states. So this is perhaps a mirror, uh, these perhaps a mirror answers. Um, and uh, I guess then we switched gears and started talking about holography, right? So I uh, listed a number of um, possible confusions or things that had been puzzles in the past. And then I guess we discussed a very simple toy model, this uh, three Qtrit code, which resolves some of those. So three Qtrit code was where um, was demonstrating that one uh, can have like, you know, um, that things like the rear Takanagi formula with a you know, correction term that sort of sees into the bulk, part of the bulk, that that, that can, might kind of make sense uh, that this, uh, um, idea of being able to reconstruct an operator on you know several uh, overlapping subsystems uh, is not a contradiction, even if they all these subsystems do not have any common support in the end. So that's nice. I guess something that was not really um, a part of the model was was any kind of geometry, right? There was a single bulk site, and I guess there was only the option that this bulk site was included in the entanglement wedge or not. So now we want to uh, uh, go about fixing that. Uh, okay, so there we go. So my zoom looks kind of funny. Okay, um, and so the idea will be, of course, to use tensor networks, right? Because already when we when we uh, discussed Mera, we saw that somehow the to compute entropy to bound the entropy for boundary region or, or a subsystem, uh, we actually it was useful to look into the bulk. So somehow right, it was useful to sort of go up on the network to find the optimal way of cutting uh, so sort of one piece of the boundary from its complement, and so that will be the idea. And so actually in the first part of this lecture today, I, I wanna focus simply on entropy and its scaling. Um, so basically trying to reproduce in the Ryotakenagi formula, um, just the one you know that say um, sees geometry without any bulk correction. And then we basically wanna combine uh, what we achieved then with this idea of, of codes, of error, of error correcting codes and uh, define holographic codes, holographic mappings, uh, again, using tensor networks. So maybe just uh, yeah, to get us started, um, so we defined this three Qtrit code um, yesterday. Um, so it came with uh, many code states, right? For every state of the bulk, there was a corresponding state of the boundary. So if you sort of went back to you know, the formulas that we wrote down and you asked, okay, you computed this code state corresponding to encoding just a zero state. It turns out that that state would just look as follows, uh, just an equal superposition oh, uh, from j equals zero to two, you know, of a state as j, j, j. Okay, that's just because i was equal to as i is equal to zero, right? In general, the formula was a sum over j, j comma j plus i comma j minus i. So this state, as I guess sometimes it's called the GHZ state, doesn't really matter. Um, we can think of it as a tensor, right? And it has an the inter the interesting property um, that the entropy of any single subsystem is log three, uh, as well as the entropy of any two subsystems, right? Because it's a pure state of three subsystems. The entropy of any single subsystem must be equal to the entropy of the complement. And it's uh, easy to see, right, that the entropy of say A is, is, is log three because A is, you know, as entangled as it can be with BC. So entangled on a three dimensional subspace. Okay, so we can sort of think of that, right? So somehow, um, pictorially, so if you think of this as a sort of a very coarse bulk, uh, we can sort of identify this with say a situation where, whoop, looks a bit horrible, uh, we have, where we have three systems, A, B, and C. And um, well, the RT surfaces are kind of those, right? And then sort of, you know, we can sort of, if, well, um, say computing the entropy of subsystem A, well, in this picture would be you know, the area of the surface, whereas in this tensor, from the perspective of the tensor, it would just be the most economic way of cutting off uh, or separating, cutting, well, this network, this very trivial network into two pieces, such that one piece only contains A and the other piece only contains BC, right? So if I want to separate A from BC in this picture, there's two, two ways of doing it. I can either cut here or I can cut here. If I cut like so, I'm only cutting a single bond of dimension three. If I'm cutting like so, I would, I would be cutting two bonds of dimension three, right? So a total dimension nine. So cutting like so gives me a better bound that gives me this upper bound of log three. And it turns out that in this state, that's actually saturated, saturated, okay? So you could think of sort of this particular code state of the three Qtrip code as being being an example. Maybe I'll, let me just maybe fix the picture up a little bit. So this uh, pink one uh, here, I'm, I'm cutting a single bond of dimension three. So this gives me sort of this log three uh, bound on entropy. Whereas if I cut it here, this would give me a bound that's more like log nine, twice log three. And indeed, 
Uh, that would be a bit like if you know if I looked at the non-minimal surface, that's like you know that's this one rather than this one over here. <clears throat> okay, so that's sort of the cartoonish picture. And now the idea uh, or the question is just can we glue together many of these states, many of these tensors together to get you know a many-body state that maybe still satisfies something like the Ryu Takanagi formula, right? So you could say this tensor satisfies some kind of discrete version of Ryu Takanagi because we can compute entropy. We can not only bound it, but we can compute it by cutting, right? Cutting um, uh, the tensor network in, you know, by a minimal cut in a way that separates the system interested in it from the component. So maybe I'll just uh, write this down. So entropy of A, as well as all the other single subsystems are is just log three. We computed this yesterday. Okay, um, so, uh, well, how are we going to do this? Um, we're going to take this beautiful picture of a tensor network that in some uh, sense, you know, tries to approximate the geometry of the hyperbolic disk in some way, right? It's of course discrete, so it can capture all symmetries, but it's some part of, you know, something that looks maybe like some fairly regular tiling, maybe not so regular uh, in this case. Um, so the idea will be, we want to somehow discretize, you know, a geometry we're interested in, and we just place tensors, you know, in the right way, and then we connect them up. And how do we want to connect them? Well, we kind of, what, what like we saw in this picture here that basically uh, an edge in the tensor network um, uh, basically corresponds to sort of a, a piece of area, right? Of area sort of that's orthogonal or transversal, uh, orthogonal to, to, to the edge. Okay. So that's kind of the, the mapping. So I guess I won't be super precise how, you know, if you are given a geometry, how you should set up this network, but you can just think of it the other way around. You can see, start with some graph, and you know whatever kind of cuts in the graph are that's supposed to be the discrete analogs of a some continuous minimal surface in a continuous geometry. Okay. So what's interesting about this network is that it's unlike MPS and PEPs, but like Mera in the sense that it's a two-dimensional network or an, a network laid out in two dimensions. But the only dangling uh, uh, legs they are here at the boundary there in one in a one-dimensional you know uh, system if you want they, they form a one-dimensional system. So this picture. Um, describes a state of, if you wish, you know, a quantum system on a, on a discrete circle. Right? And, and that's, that's this one over here. Those are the only dangling legs. Everything else is being contracted in this network. Okay. But of course, there's nothing special about this particular picture. I could have taken any graph with a bunch of dangling legs and used this to define a quantum state. That's just the most general definition of a tensor network. But we'll always draw these pictures today because there's an interest in, you know, modeling aspects of, say, ADS, CFD. So maybe just to write down a concrete formula, <clears throat> um, I guess we discussed that we can think of these states uh, uh, sort of in two ways. We can either take a bunch of uh, a bunch of tensors, one for each vertex, and then you know project or con contract pairs of indices. Uh, another way of thinking about them is to take lots of maximum entangled states, which are the links, and then projecting you know parts of them uh, on tensors. So I'm going to take the second perspective uh, today, just for convenience of calculating. So my, the idea will be, we are going to take, um, so I'll, I'll write down a formula, we'll, we'll talk about what it means. So I'm going to want to write, I want to write down a formula, sort of a generic form, well, formula for, for an arbitrary state of this form described by such a tensor network um, and the state of the, of the well, this, I guess I call it the boundary state, but I just mean the state defined by this picture, by this network, okay. So uh, here's a sort of a two-step process by which I can write down a concrete formula for the state. So I'm going to take a tensor product, a big tensor product, over lots of maximum entangled states, one for each edge in the network, including these dangling legs, which are which I'm just going to think of again an edge. So lots of maximum entangled states, and so this is a big tensor product over all edges. I'll denote those by x and y, x tilde y. So x x tilde y means there's an edge between vertex x and vertex y. Okay, so imagine that maybe this is x, this is y, and uh, there's an edge here in between. Oop, there's an edge here, edge here in between. Now for each of these edges, I wanna take a maximum entangled state. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to denote this maximum entangled state by xy, cat xy. Okay, so this guy is a maximum entangled state. So maximum entangled state, right, is something that looks like cat ii, sum over i from one to some dimension d. And um, so it's a maximum entangled state of dimension d. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm not only including these edges by which we, uh, that we use to contract, but also the dangling ones here. Okay, so what I wrote down here is a is a quantum state that has indices on the boundary as well as in the bulk. Right, there's, there's lots of indices as each vertex because I have not yet done any contraction. This is just a product of many, many, many maximum entangled states. 
you could think of it as sort of the skeleton of this graph that just consists consists of edges but not vertices. And so it's kind of like you know here's just a bunch of edges. You could think of them as being arranged, but they have not yet been glued together by the tensors, by the vertex tensors. So uh, there are subsystems, right? There are subsystems here corresponding to the boundary. Maybe I'll denote them in gray, and maybe well these are maybe, maybe this, these are boundary things here. I guess in my picture the the dangling ones they always uh, maybe they look like so. Uh, so these are subsystems of the state because they include the dangling legs. Maybe I'm going to write this down, including dangling edges or legs. Um, and then there's more subsystems, right? There's this subsystem here, that subsystem, that subsystem. That's just like, you know, all the sort of the subsystems were, were sort of half of these max entangled states. And, and those are one-to-one -one corresponds to the tensors and uh, with the vertices of this graph, okay? So now what's missing is the part where I actually glue things together. And this I can achieve simply by applying a tensor product of bras. And namely, I just take the, a bra corresponding to the vertex tensor, or maybe I should take the complex conjugate, but we won't worry about this today, um, and multiply from the left. Okay, so I'm just taking another big tensor product, but now the next tensor product is over the vertices. Maybe I'll write X in bulk and only the ones on these sort of bulk sides, because that's where we, place tensors. And maybe the tensor at, at side X is called uh, VX. So basically what I'm doing is this, okay. So right, that means I would take a tensor here, V1, V2, V3, and so on. And maybe there, would also, there was also belt here, so it looks a bit nicer, okay. So it's very important to note that these tensor products are not the same, right? This is a tensor product I uh, sorry, these these cats uh, they're they're sort of not aligned, right? Because here I'm I'm looking at the vertices, here I'm looking at the edges, but the Hilbert space associated to vertex is it is consists of many tensor factors, one for each edge, right? That that that's in, incident to this vertex. So it's you know maybe in, as a simple example, um, say if I had uh, you know a maximum tangled state here, a maximum tangled state here, and one there, and now you know I'm well I guess that's a very boring example, but but okay. Uh, now I want to glue the, this one together by say, you know, vertex tensor one, vertex tensor two. You see that some of the first max entangled state where it has two subsystems, one and two, um, that's those are the tensor factors on which this state lives. Maybe this one lives on subsystem three and four, but um, this tensor here, right? That's a tensor on subsystems two and three. So they're not aligned. So it's not like, so this is not the same as taking the inner product of this tensor with this max entangled state. It doesn't even make sense technically. So these uh, these guys, they are the tensors. Uh, they set, that set up these vertices in the sort of bulk of this graph. Okay, so that's a completely general way of writing down an arbitrary tensor network state. And uh, you could object that somehow there's a little bit of a strange uh, notation convention thing going on here, because uh, that's a state right on all these Hilbert spaces indicated here. And now I'm projecting only on at these green sides, which probably I should have drawn in blue. So um, somehow, um, well, this thing looks like an inner product, right? But there's actually systems remaining. I could make this explicit by basically adding a big identity operator here. I could say, well, we take this whole thing, tensor identity on the boundary of all these boundary indices, right? That would make it maybe more clear. The same, it's the same in this picture, right? I start with these bell pairs. Maybe these are the bulk vertices. These are the two dangling legs as I'm sort of looking at it from the side, but I only do a projection here and there. Whereas here I'm just doing an identity map, right? So writing down this identity map is a bit like adding identity maps here. Okay. And this it's usually convention and 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 confirmation that we omit identity maps when when they're well, okay. we just omit them by convention. Okay. Is there any question about this formula? So that's now a formula for a state, and it's exactly the state described by a general tensor network uh, defined by a general graph. The only assumption being that the one dimensions are all the same and equal to capital D. Okay, uh, good. Um, so maybe that's just for future reference. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of see, oops, or to sort of you know write down one precise uh, formula now. Uh, um, okay, so maybe I'll remove those. Now, um, now we have discussed a little bit about the state and we'll, I'll ask one last time, you know, how can we bound the entropy for subsystem in such a state? I think we have discussed this in many cases for MPS, for PEPs, for MERA and so on. Um, so what's a general bound on entropy in an arbitrary tensor network? Entropy in 
any tensor networks, in particular the one on the left. Um, entropy always satisfies the same bound that we always discussed, right? Namely, entropy can be upper bounded by the max entropy and max entropy of a subsystem. Let's say the subsystem corresponding to these legs here, if you want. Um, well, how can I bound this, right? So what, what I always do is I have one subsystem A, then there's the complement. That, that, let's say that's, er whoop, that's everything else here, right? That's all the other indices over here, whoop, a complement. And well, how do I get bounds on the entropy? I have to cut uh, bonds on, of the tensor network until A and A complement are, being set, are no longer connected, okay? So there's lots of ways of doing it, right? I could, for example, cut like this. Um, that's probably not a good idea. It's not very economic, it gives me poor bound. The best way of cutting is of course by cutting well minimally. That gets me the tightest bound of entropy. So I so any uh, well entropy in any tensor network satisfies the following bound, namely we can always upper bound the max entropy by the logarithm of the dimensions um, corresponding to a minimal cut in the network. Okay. And here the well a minimal cut would probably look like this. Um, let's say like so. This would be one minimal cut. Sorry, that's a bit hard to read and ugly. And another minimal cut would be like this. There's two minimal cuts here, right? So if I look at this cut, okay, and I, I sort of drew it, you know, how you would maybe draw it, you know, dramatically, uh, how you would draw, dramatic draw the minimal surface. What I'm really doing is I'm cutting this bond, I'm cutting that bond, I'm cutting that one and that one, right? That's um, choosing any cut, and hence in particular, the, the minimal cut gives me an upper bound entropy, namely logarithm of D, uh, because that's a single bond dimension to the size of the minimal cut, which is of course the same as the size of the minimal cut times log of one dimension. Okay, and you could call this a Rio Takanagi bound, right? It's bounding entropy in terms of a minimal cut for the network. So maybe we'll call this the RT bound. Okay, and um, again, that's the number of bonds uh, in a minimal cut. Maybe I'll write this down. So gamma A is min cut separating A from A complement. Um, yeah, and uh, D is just a bond dimension, dimension of a single bond. Okay. Great. So, um, uh, that sounds promising. And it's of course, exactly the same reasoning we used when we discussed Mera, right? When we got this logarithmic scaling, that was sort of our guess at what the best way of cutting Mera was. And the interesting question, of course, is, you know, when is this, uh, when is this actually tight, this bound? Because if this bound was tight, then we would have sort of proved the Takanagi formula in our toy model. So to answer this question, maybe um, let's uh, remind ourselves how this proof went, okay? And, uh, Hopefully that's not boring because we discussed it already once or twice, but, but I think it's you now it has some interesting uh, uh, geometry along with it. So maybe I want to duplicate this picture here so that we can draw. Okay. So how did this argument go? Let me just uh, clean up the picture a little bit. Okay. Well, we can do this. Uh, from scratch. Okay. So the idea was, right, we focus, um, we, we, we found these edges by which we could disconnect uh, A from A complement. Let's say we pick those. Um, right now, A is disconnected from its complement. Um, and now we just coarse grain the network, right? So that was the idea. So we are basically just thinking of everything in here as uh, being one tensor. Maybe uh, So this entire region of the network here, and we're just thinking of a, of a single linear map from these pink uh, to, to, the, to the boundary vertices. Maybe we call this one L as in left. And then the rest, we also coarse grain. I mean, coarse graining is maybe a strange word. I, I just mean we I block them together. I think of this uh, sub tensor network as a single gigantic tensor, just forgetting structure. Okay, so that's the other part of the tensor network. Okay. It's R. Um, and so we see that actually the state psi, well, this, this, the state um, psi that's defined by the tensor network, uh, we can think in the following way. We start with maximum entangled states, namely the ones corresponding to these bonds here. So we start with maximum entangled states and we have sort of, uh, well, uh, say we have, how many do we have? Well, size of this minimal cut, uh, many 
maximally entangled uh, states of dimension D. And then, well, we apply a map L and another map R. Okay, and then outcome system A, outcome system B. That's sort of a cartoon, well, a coarse uh, sort of block together, coarse grain, cartoon uh, sort of picture of, um, of a way of producing the state, right? So these are these two blobs. Um, and that's the maximum entanglement tiers, right? And, uh, and that was basically the idea. It, it, so this picture shows that the rank of either reduced sense matrix is at most uh, the, dim the dimensionality here, the dimensionality here, well, we have uh, gamma A many maximum things at dimension D, that's dimension D to the size of gamma A. Okay, that, that was, that's a proof of the bound. Okay, so this implies the bound. Um, but now it's interesting to ask, well, can we read off from this picture when this bound should be tight? Okay. And uh, well, who has a guess, like what, what, what should L and R satisfy um, such that entropy is not only bounded by the size of gamma times log D, but actually equal? If someone wants to wait, they get a guess. So what are the maps that don't, uh, yeah, Peter, I think you, you want to. Um, maybe that they're maximally entangled with respect to the smallest system. Uh, that's right. If you think of this as a state, it would mean it's sort of sort of as entangled as this, these these pink guys. That's sort of from a state picture. And if you think of of it as a linear operator, that would exactly be equivalent to saying this linear operator should be an isometry yeah. from the smaller to the larger system. Exactly. So if L and R are isometries, then this bound is actually saturated. Um, so it would be saturated if L and R isometries. So for example, unitary, but in, in general, of course, the minimal cut will be smaller than uh, the, the size of the boundary in, in the interesting cases. So it can only be an isometry. Okay. So the question is when are these coarse grained pictures isometries? Well, one way of achieving this is of course of, to take lots of small isometries and hopefully compose them a good way to get a big isometry. And that's basically the idea behind what's known as the Hattie model. Uh, short for well, uh, which is named after the, the initials of the authors. Um, so the happy model, which is Harlow, uh, Preskill, Kostovsky, uh, and Yoshida, um, they basically said, well, let's just take small tensors that are isometric in any possible way. Such tensors are called perfect tensors. I'll define them formally in a moment. And um, then let's think about, you know, in which cases L and R are actually isometries. So that was their idea. So they said, well, let's just choose tensors for constructing our network or our state that are called perfect, um, which means that they are isometries in any possible way. And I'll, I'll write, I'll say what this means precise in a moment. So if I take an arbitrary tensor, maybe this tensor here, but there's lots of ways of thinking of this as a linear map. I can pick any subset of the legs as inputs, any subset of the legs as outputs. Now, such a map can of course only be uh, isomet isometric if the number of input legs is less or equal to the number of output legs, right? Otherwise there's not enough space in the output. Um, and I could demand th that this tensor should be an isometry. However, I group the legs into input and output pairs as long as the number of inputs legs is less or equal to the number of output legs. Okay, so here's two ways of doing it. There's of course many more. Maybe one way is I'm saying, I could say, well, I want those to be inputs and uh, those to be outputs, right? Or I could choose those to be outputs um, and those to be inputs. Maybe that's a bit of a strange one, but okay. But, but whenever the number of uh, uh, inputs is less or equal to the number of outputs, I would like this tensor, it's always the same tensor to define an isometry. There's lots of more options, of course. Of course, if I pick three of them to be inputs and two of them to be outputs, then I, I, there's no way of doing it. Okay. Um, okay, what's an example of such a tensor? Actually, we saw one when we discussed the three Qtrit code, because if you think of this three Qtrit code, right? We have this three Qtrit code. Um, and then we proved, okay, oops, then we proved we can actually think of this tensor, you know, we can write this in a different way. There's a unitary sitting here. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we can sort of think of 
can look at this object um, and this use unitary, but it really means that basically if you take, you know, if I rearrange the picture and I maybe move this one upwards, it's basically saying that this encoding map for the three Qtrid code, which in principle was a map from one to three indices, it says that even if I think of this one of the outputs as an input, it's still a unitary. Okay, it's maybe just an aside. Actually, the three Qtrid code is such an such an object. It's a perfect tensor with four legs, meaning that it's unitary from any two to any other two. Okay. So that's just maybe a comment. So these things exist, and we actually saw them, and for good reasons, because you know they they they're supposed to form the elementary building blocks of our, of our happy model. Okay. Now. Um, uh, Okay, so, so that's a promising start, right? So basically we know that at the smaller scale, a single tensor behaves in a good way. It's isometric in any direction. Now the question is, if you look at an entire network like here, you know, is it still, does that still define an isometry? Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll write down, uh, I'll draw an example situation. So suppose we have maybe, uh, I'm sorry, I have to copy this. Um, so that we actually have a nice example to discuss. Let's say we have a part of a tensor network that looks like this. Um, doop, doop, doop. Let's see, maybe like so, and maybe they all have five legs, hopefully. Sorry, all the pictures will again be in my write up. Okay, so hopefully now all of them have, say, three, have the same number of legs. So imagine, so this is a you know, one particular tensor network that we might be interested in, and maybe uh, this part here, um, sorry, up to, whoa, what's going on? It's maybe subsystem A, okay. Um, in this particular network, I guess one way of choosing this minimal cut through the network, right, would be like, like this. This would be gamma A. Now, suppose this is a, these, all these tensors are perfect tensors. So what would be a sufficient condition for, um, well, uh, the Ritagi-Nagi formula being satisfied with equality? Well, what I, again, what we wanted to show is that this, uh, this entire blue region, which is the three tensors here, they together form an isometry from those inputs here, the ones that these edges that cross the RT surface out to the boundary. And likewise, we want that this part of the network forms an isometry again going out to the boundary. Okay. So how could I convince you that that's in fact a, uh, you know, a, uh, the, the case? Well, I could just orient the legs of all these tensors in such a way that, you know, I, I, that the, well, the, the orientation, they, they start being oriented um, away from the RT surface. So that's sort of the input of the isometry, right? That's sort of the part here. And here we're sort of going in. And well, at the boundary, they should all point outwards. And now the remain on the all remaining edges, I have to orient in a way that you know there's at least as many outputs as inputs. So there can be at most two inputs, uh, such that you know each individual uh, tensor can be thought of as an isometry. Okay. So um, I guess, for example, what I could do is I could, for example, um, oops, uh, probably do something like this. All right. So now this tensor has two inputs and three outputs, one input and four outputs two inputs and three outputs. That would be one way of doing it, right? And now, I'm, so now what we've achieved, we have achieved uh, the following, namely we wrote this tensor L as a composition of many isometries, one after the other. Just, it's nothing but a quantum circuit, okay? Uh, and now we could do the same with a complement here. And if we managed to do so, we would have proved the RT formula. So if we can orient the edges, um, such that you know at each uh, vertex the number of inputs is less or equal to the number of outputs, and um, sort of maybe I'll write this as follows. And from the RT surface, uh, things always point away, um, you know, either to A or uh, well, well, they point away towards A, right? Or maybe I guess that's a that's a weird way of writing it. But what I mean by this um, is that um, sort of. At the RT surface, they point away and they point into A at the boundary and into A complement at the other part of the boundary. Okay, so maybe that's not a, a great way. Um, maybe I should write like this. They point away from A and they, so the edges at the boundary, they point to, towards the boundary. Maybe, maybe I could just write it like, like this. 
Um, then this proves, that's sort of a graphical proof that these maps L and R are isometries. Just because they're now a composition of isometries as in a quantum circuit um, and the RT uh, formula holds. So not just a bound, but it is now true because of what we discussed here, L and R are isometries that entropy of A is exactly equal to size of minimal cut times log dimension. So now it's it's not clear, of course, if we can actually do this. But if you can, okay, now we sort of we just have a geometric problem. The geometric problem is can we do this with orienting of edges or not? Okay. And it turns out uh, that okay, in general, of course, it's not always possible. Like we sort of bottlenecks in your graph, and then the strategy fails. Uh, but uh, what the authors of, 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 well showed in their paper is that you can always do this if your graph is uh, well it's planar. Um, if it satisfies some discrete version of negative curvature. Um, and if the system, the boundary system we're looking at is a single interval. So I think those were uh, sufficient conditions. So in particular, so if you know, in this, in this example we showed here, they could show that that's always possible. Okay. So it only applies and, you know, uh, it doesn't apply in general, the strategy. So the model only works in, you know, somewhat special situations, you could say, uh, but What's of course nice is that's really extremely concrete, right? We are just doing, you're just thinking about tensors and orienting the right way. And you know, it's, it's really just like a circuit picture. You can really understand how quantum information is flowing, right? You, you're, drawing the, you're drawing how it, how it flows. So maybe to summarize, um, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's very nice. It's very concrete um, and intuitive in a way what, what's going on, right? You're, you're really sort of decomposing your state basically. You're, I mean, you're finding in a graphical way a Schmidt composition of your state. Um, um, but maybe uh, it's uh, sort of, it's not the end of the story because it only applies maybe in, um, doesn't apply in generality. Um, yeah. Of course it applies in, in a case of, of much interest which would be some kind of you know, negatively curved uh, regular, regular tiling of hyperbolic disk um, and you know, sort of single interval subsystems. Um, but one might still ask, you know, is there another way of doing it? Okay. And maybe just because I said this a, a few times, um, kind of what, what, we had, what we managed to do here by or orienting these edges and having this unitarity isom or isometric nature, we really sort of, you know, wrote, we can now sort of think of the bulk in some sense as a quantum circuit, actually it's many quantum circuits um, that are sort of routing the information through the network, right? So for any choice of boundary subsystem, you have you basically have a quant uh, two quantum circuits from the RT surface out to the two pieces of the boundary. Of course, if we look at a different boundary subsystem, you get different circuits. And because these tensors are perfect, they are they are, they are gates quantum gates in any possible way. Uh, sort of you know that's that's where the flexibility where the flexibility comes from. So in some sense, it's you know from, I don't know usually unitarity is some kind of causality, right? But there's lots of kind of ways of thinking about uh, the network here. There's not just like one flow of time if you want, but, but many. Okay, so that's one model. Um, now I wanna discuss another model, um, which is maybe less uh, concrete in a way, uh, but it's amenable to different techniques and, and that applies a bit more generally. Um, and, and, and that's something we, we, we cooked up a, a little later uh, and it's based on random tensors. But maybe before that, I just wanna ask if there's any questions about a happy model, how it works, why it works. I have a question about that. Yes, yes, yes. So you had the interior edges, but I didn't understand why you, you put the arrows. Wasn't the point that the the inputs were less than the outputs, but I can count that there are more outputs in the, uh, to A in that case. Uh, it, sorry, can you, can you say again, uh, which direction? Because uh, uh, you had those you interior say... edges that you- Yes. Um, you applied arrows to uh, yes. the ones that go from the middle dot, or sorry, the middle node to the outer nodes within. Uh, Those here? Uh, to, uh, to the left of uh, the boundary, gamma A. Yes, yes, like this one to say? Because uh, you, I don't understand why you have that interior line from that, from the upper left to that one. Uh, from here to here? Yeah. Ah, right. Yeah, so somehow, so the idea was, I, 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 wanna, I wanna basically find a way of building this quantum state 
by starting with maximum entanglement and then applying a, a unitary or an isometric map. Okay. And so uh, here there's sort of three building blocks. So, but basically what I want to do is I want to start, maybe I can write this in a different way. I, I sort of start with sort of three maximum entangled states. They have the ones here. Um, let's say like this. Oh, well, maybe I can, I can try to draw it a bit better. Like this. Okay. And now I want to imagine I apply, you know, time evolutions, little time evolutions, and which means isometries, unitaries or more generally isometries. Um, so somehow maybe I want to first apply say, well, this time evolution here, right? And somehow I would, uh, that would mean I apply sort of a little gate here. And now this one would have four outputs. Okay. And now in the next step, um, I would apply this one here. And uh, I see, well, I see now it has, it has you know, these strangely, these strangely oriented arrows that you pointed out. Because this one points here, I can think of it as an input of the next step, okay? So like this, right? And similarly, sorry, I think I, exactly. And similarly here. So this tensor, I will now apply, this unit here will now apply here, and likewise here. And those guys, I don't do anything to. So somehow what this orienting allows, it, this orientation gives me some kind of time order, right? It's kind of tells me, and an, it gives me an order in which I can think of applying these gates step by step. Okay, and because I oriented them in a way that satisfied this constraint, I know that my tensors in that case, I can always think of as an isometry. So it's always a good time evolution if you want. If I couldn't orient them in, in, in such a way, then somehow I would be applying a non-unitary and non-isometric map at some point in, in time. And that would not preserve entanglement. That could you know, create or destroy entanglement. But because there's a way of sorting things, you know, kind of a, a sort of a time order, and this time order is encoded in some sense by the orientation of these edges, uh, that sort of is consistent with treating every tensor as an isometry. That allows me then to conclude that these three tensors together, which is the same as this linear map L, is also an isometry. Does that sort of address your question, or is is? I I see better. Um, okay, I see better. Thank you. So somehow there's no uh, physical meaning, if you want, to the orientation. It's just a, a way of sort of, you know, uh, convincing you by picture that there is a way of thinking about this part of the tensor network as a, a circuit or as, you know, a, a, a composition of isometries. And that would have, of course, that would have not been valid if, uh, uh, say, I, if I would have oriented those, say, this way around, somehow there would be a problem here because there's more inputs than outputs, right? And so, so this would not be a valid sort of, you know, proof or valid way of convincing you that this thing defines an isometry. Okay. All right. Great. So now we'll discuss this other model and hopefully we still have a little bit of time to then talk about uh, codes. So the other model is uh, called the random tensor network model. Um, so that's something we uh, proposed a little while ago. And the idea is very simple. The idea is just we want to take, instead of sort of fine tuning these bulk tensors to be perfect, we're just going to take them at random, but we to pick the bond dimension to be really large. So we're going to choose random tensors at each vertex independently um, of large bond dimension. So large, large D. At large. Um, yeah, and then we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay, in random, I should maybe say what random means. Uh, you could just take them to be random Gaussians. You could take them, you could pick them according from the Haar measure, which is the same as Gaussian except for the normalization, but normalization is anyways doesn't matter here because we will always normalize the quantum state back to norm one, right? It's even, we, we didn't even talk about that before. Um, you could take them from uh, to be random stabilizer states. Uh, it will, we will see that the argument only requires sort of knowledge of the of low moments, basically the mean and the variance of the distribution. So there's lots of choices. But for concreteness, you could think harm measure random Gaussians. Um, and what's the motivation? Well, one um, motivation, which is uh, uh, is, is basically that one can show that random tensors are close to perfect with high probability. So in large bond dimensions, um, a tensor that you pick at random is approximately an isometry from any you know, number of legs uh, 
that's less than, than half well, in, in a certain sense. So random tensors, perfect um, with high probability. Um, now, of course, if that was the only thing, then we were just back to the old model, but now you know, the, the gigantic one dimension. So maybe that would not be so interesting. The other sort of thing that conspires is kind of that there's also kind of a general position with, it, with, with each other. So somehow that helps like sort of destroy some sort of accidental symmetries that you might have from that decrease entropy. Maybe that's another intuition. Okay. And so one can show that in these random tensor network models, the RT formula holds approximately um, or in leading order. So random tensor networks, Sorry, uh, I guess I should have uh, introduced this abbreviation. So RTN is for me, random tensor networks. So random tensor network states um, satisfy uh, RT formula approximately, uh, namely, well, I guess we already know what this means. Entropy is, you say, approximately, so let's say in leading order, maybe that's constant corrections or very small corrections um, proportional to the size um, okay. Same form is here, right? Proportional to the size of the minimal cut. Okay. And that's going to be true with high probability um, for any graph and for any subsystem, not whether it's now planar or in higher dimension or whatnot. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, but of course, it, the bond size of the bond dimension might need to be much larger in one case than the other case. So the scaling of the bond dimension with the other parameters, the geometry, the volume, and so on, that's not obvious. But what I'm saying is if you fix a graph, if you fix your subsystem, then uh, this will be true um, with high probability as the bond dimension increases and it will maybe become clear from the, from the argument why this, is, why this is so, okay. So that's kind of the appeal and one can sort of prove this without sort of, you know, um, understanding much about geometry and about, about graphs, which is nice. Um, now, I wanna maybe give you a sketch of how this works. Um, uh, because it's, I think maybe it, there's some useful uh, technical tools that, that you might learn this way. But just as a comment, so before we had this discussion, uh, this very nice discussion, um, uh, where one of you said, well, L should be maximum entangled on the smaller subsystem, right? It, which basically says, you know, um, it's entropy L, if you think of L as a quantum state, it's entropy should be maximal. It should be the dimension, log dimension of this, this pink um, uh, leg. And then I said, oh, exactly, that's exactly right. And it's actually equivalent to being isometry. Okay. So that means that the property that a tensor is perfect, which is just means it's isometric with respect to any such splitting, is a, is a property that only depends on entropies. Okay. So a tensor, in other words, a tensor is uh, perfect if and only if it's the entropy of any subsystem is as large as it can be. Okay. And as large as it can be, of course, means logarithm of the dimension, but only if you look at less or equal to half of the system, okay? Because entropy of a system is equal to entropy of the complement. Okay. So in other words, um, and I guess we already observed this up here, um, right? Because this guy is also an isometry from one to two legs. Uh, a, a perfect tensor is nothing but a tensor that satisfies this discrete Ryu Takenagi formula, which means that the claim I made here actually is a, is a generalization of what's written here. Okay, so maybe that's uh, maybe this was a bit quick. It's also not super important, but I just wanted to point out that the property of being special, uh, is, uh, sorry, of being perfect is just a special case of satisfying the RT formula. Okay, because one can sort of if by treating an operator um, as a quantum state, one can capture the fact that this operator is an isometry uh, by saying the entropy of the inputs should be maximal. All right, now. Maybe I want to talk a little bit about why this is true. So why in a random tensor network state, um, the RT formula is approximately true. Um, and the first observation that I want to make is of course that um, we already know that entropy cannot not be larger than what's written here, right? By the general RT bound that we did discuss at the beginning. So I only have to show that entropy is at least as large as what's written here. You know, maybe up to some small corrections. So we only need to prove a lower bound. And um, we mentioned at some point, you know, ent entropy is an annoying quantity. There's these Rennie entropies and the Rennie entropies for integer n, they're actually much nicer to work with if this, well, for integer n large equals to two. Um, and also the Rennie entropies with parameter larger than one are smaller than the fundamental entropy. 
So since we're looking for a lower bound, it's of course enough then to prove a lower bound on the Renyi alpha entropy for alpha larger than one. And we'll pick the first integer larger than one, which is two. Okay. The strategy will be uh, to show enough to show that, um, well, a lower bound on the Renyi two entropy. Bound on Renyi two entropy of A. Just to remind you, that's minus logarithm of the trace of row A squared. Okay. Now, we never worried about normalizing our tensor networks here. So maybe I also don't want to assume that rho is a normalized quantum state. So to make it a normalized quantum state, I should divide the sensor matrix by its trace. Okay. And because it appears with a square, I should divide by the trace rho squared. So that's, of course, I, we didn't write this because we usually always do with normalized quantum states. But you know, if I take these tensors at random and I contract them, then in, in general, the normal shrink. Okay, so I, I just wanted to be slightly precise about this. Um, okay, and the point why it was this good enough because Renyi two entropy is always less equal to the phenomenon entropy, it's always e less or equal to the max entropy and the max entropy satisfies uh, this other bound. Okay, cool. Um, well, I guess we want to show a lower bound on entropy and we are going to use the Renyi two entropy. Um, now I want to tell you the two key ingredients that matter here and probably, I mean, you, I think you know them very well. in fact, maybe from Netta's lecture, well, one of them anyways, uh, one of them is of course a replica trick and that's the idea of, uh, right? What, what's the key challenge here, right? The key challenge is, is computing this object, right? For, for, for my random tensor network. So, that's a quadratic function of row A, which means that if I, I can linearize it by just taking two copies of row A, okay? And that's uh, the, a special case of the replica trick. So that's one ingredient. Uh, because there's only two copies, um, the only permutations that are around are swaps and we call it the swap trick and contour information, but it's the same as the replica trick. Um, so that's the first ingredient. And the second ingredient then is we have to understand how uh, tensors behave. If we look at two, two identical copies of a random tensor and we compute, for example, averages. So what I want to do is basically I want to compute the average of this green quantity uh, with you. And uh, hopefully we'll see that this average is something like uh, D to the minus the size of the minimal cut. And then, you know, after taking minus the logarithm, we get exactly some other size of the minimal cut like here. Okay, so first ingredient is this uh, swap trick. Again, special case of replica of replica trick. Um, and it's simply the following formula, namely trace uh, of an arbitrary operator, say of this operator row squared, is the same as taking uh, two copies of the state row A and then computing the expectation value of the swap operator. So the swap operator I'll denote by F sub A. Um, so F sub A is the operator. It's okay. So what's the Hilbert space here? Hilbert space here is two copies of the A Hilbert space, right? So there's two copies of the A Hilbert space, A and A. And the operator is the one that swaps the two copies. Okay. Um, right. And right, what's the proof? Well, if we just draw, draw a picture, right? This is row A. This is row A. Um, now we are swapping and then we're taking a trace. Uh, if you simplify the picture, you just see it's trace row squared. Okay. Um, now, uh, we maybe don't want to deal with the de reduced density matrix directly or with two copies of it. We just want to deal with two copies of the overall quantum state. So we can also write this, of course, by uh, as follows. We can just take two copies of the entire tensor network state and then acting with the same operator, you know, tensor identity on the rest. And as said before, I will never write down identities today. So I'll just write FA here. And whenever I write FA, I mean the, the operator that swaps two copies of A, but it acts as, the, as uh, trivially on the rest. Okay. So that's sort of this convention. F sub A always swaps the A's and it never touches anything else. Okay. Very good. So now we sort of linearize the problem in a way while well, at the expense of having to take two copies of our state. Uh, the other ingredient that we need is the following. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, it's uh, uh, we have to know 
right? If you think about what's the state psi, right? So the state psi, we wrote a formula down here. And again, let me maybe remove these identities for good measure. Well, well cat psi contains all of these bras of the random tensors. So bra psi contains the corresponding cats. If you take two copies of psi, we have two copies of you know cat v bra v for any of these random tensors. So what we need to understand is somehow how random tensors behave um, if we take several copies of them. And the easiest question that you could ask is, oh, suppose you take a random tensor setting, say, at one of these vertices, and you take two copies of it. So Vx is you know, in some Hilbert space, say dx, uh, random, how random. Then the simplest question we could ask is, what's the expectation value of this object? Right? So that's a, a random operator. And we could ask, what, what is it equal to? If we take its average, that's like the yeah, it's the expectation value of this random variable, variable. Okay. Now, what do we see? I mean, we see that this is a symmetric tensor. Okay. So it's a, it's, a, it's a thing that doesn't change when we interchange the two copies of our Hilbert space. Um, so it turns out because of of, of because the symmetric subspaces and reduce the representation and so on. Actually, this thing is exactly proportional to the projection on the symmetric subspace. It's normalized as a quantum state because I will normalize this, this measure to be a probability measure with big things at random. So what this thing is going to be, is basically going to be proportional. Maybe I'm just, I'm just going to say this. It's going to be proportional to the project on the symmetric subspace, which is identity plus swap. Okay, and I'm now using subscripts X because we are swapping two copies of the X Hilbert space. Okay. So that's, uh, that's the idea. Okay, so we have, uh, we have the two key ingredients. Um, we know how to uh, linearize a uh, trace row squared, but at the expense of take, having to take two copies, two copies of psi contains two copies of all of these random tensors. Um, if I average you know, them tensor by tensor, for each one, I get a sum of identity plus one. Okay. And now basically it's just a, a matter of doing a calculation, right? Now we can sort of combine these things and we can write down a formula for the say expected value of trace y squared, okay? And then so one has to do a bit more math to show that it works with high probability and so on and so forth, but maybe we don't uh, want to bother with this for now. Okay. So now I'm just thinking if I really want to run through this uh, computation or not, um, but maybe I will, um, yeah, let's see how it goes. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll just tell you sort of what, what will come out of it. Or maybe we do, maybe we do a few steps. Okay, let's see. Are there any questions about what we what we wrote so far? Uh, so how worried do we want to feel about the fact that there's an expectation value and log of the expectation is not the same as the expectation of the log? Uh, we want to be very worried in principle. Uh, so we want to prove that, for example, the trace concentrates. And then um, somehow, some of the bad part is this one, I think, actually, because for the other one, one can use Jensen's inequality to get a lower bound. Uh, and, and that one goes, so one of the, you know, one of the two things is, uh, I guess we're also dividing two expectation values, <laughs> which is not the same as, as you know uh, the expectation one of the of the ratio. So uh, what what you can do is you can basically show that er actually everything here concentrates. For example, you could show the trace concentrates. You can kind of treat it as a scalar, and then you only have minus log of trace rho a squared, and that you can do about using Jensen's inequality in terms of minus log of the expectation value. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. So I'll be super heuristic. I'll just compute the means and then uh, claim things are you know concentrating or self origin or whatnot. Great. Um, any other question? We have to copy our formula from here. So that's the state we really care about now, right? Just for reference. So now maybe we actually, uh, let's try to, to look at this in a more, more detail because I think there will be a nice answer. Um, so uh, to simplify our bookkeeping a little bit, I mean, the things that we have to worry about are these random tensors, right? And we will, uh, we will so we will take two copies of this entire tensor network states. So we'll have two copies of this random tensor here. Um, whereas this thing, I mean, that's just some arbitrary quantum state. And of course it will enter the calculation at some point, but let's not worry about it, just give it a name. So let's define as omega the state that's just, you know, this uh, tensor product of these maxi entangled states. And we'll worry about it at the end. And then we can just write omega here. So omega is kind of the state of the, you know, bulk in some sense uh, before you actually do anything to it by, you know, making it part of, by adding these random tensors. Okay. So now we want to look at trace rho a squared. <clears throat> and as discussed before, we can write this as trace two copies of the 
tensor network state and then swapping on the, the A's and not touching anything else. Okay, and I guess we want to compute an expectation value in the end. Okay, the thing we want to compute is the expectation value of this. All right. Um, okay. So now I'm just going to, uh, well, plug in the formulas. Okay, so I'm going to plug in these formulas. Um, so I have, uh, you know, whoop, two copies of uh, this state here. Uh, maybe I'll just write this expectation value trace. Um, tensor product uh, Vx. Now we have, uh, well, I guess, tw sorry, two copies of each, two copies here, two copies there, two copies here, two copies of the last one. So these are the two copies of my quantum state, and I still have the swap operator flowing around here. Okay. Now remember that these tensors, they are sitting at bulk indices. Whereas um, this swap operator is swapping boundary Hilbert spaces, right? It's, it's doing nothing to the bulk, right? Because I mean, we started with boundary state and that's where this thing adds, acts. So this guy, which is really missing an identity is commuting with that operator, right? One acts on the bulk and identity on the rest and the other on the boundary. And likewise with this one here, right? So what I can do is I can, you know, depending on my taste, I can either move this guy to the very left or I can move this one through, uh, well, using cyclicity to the other side and then through this uh, the swap operator. Okay, and then all the cats in the bras are sort of nicely aligned. So let's do that. And then we're almost done. Uh, this picture, hopefully for later. Uh -huh. So we have, um, Two copies of omega. Now, big tensor product, um, vertex tensors twice, and the swap operator. Okay, and now uh, this expectation value is still hanging around here, but all of these tensors I'm going to choose independently. So, what I can just do is I can just average these term by term, or fact, factor by factor, right? Product, expectation value, product, the same as product with expectation values if randomness is chosen independently. Okay. But now what happens if I average two copies of a tensor Well, I get a sum identity plus swap. Okay, so that's that's now what's going to happen. So maybe just to be sure, here sort of I, uh, we use the swap trick. Now in the next step, I'm going to know, uh, to use my knowledge of the statistics of random tensors. And again, that's sort of a very universal thing. It doesn't I mean anything that's vaguely like the uniform distribution base like that. And what comes out is two copies here. And, um, a big product um, of, well, identity plus swap. Then we multiply with the swap on A, okay. So, phew, almost. So I guess uh, beautiful to end, to end a lecture series on a technical calculation. That's uh, what everyone enjoys, um, okay. So, so now actually we are almost done because we see, well, we have a big product and for each term we either choose identity or we choose to swap, okay? In other words, we can, we can replace this now by a sum, a sum of all possible subsets of my bulk and the, and, and the subset dictator says, tells me where I swap and the complement is where I don't swap, right? So I'm just multiplying out this, all these products. So I can also write this as a big sum of all subsets M of the bulk. And then I have, you know, trace omega, omega, twice and well I'm swapping all these sites in M and then I'm also swapping A. So maybe I'll just write this as, as a swap operator on the two copies of both A and M. Okay, so now who has a hunch of what I mean what is this thing equal to? This the summoned. So now we just use the replica trick in reverse, right? Because what we see here is we have a, two copies of a quantum state and we have a swap operator on some part of it. So that's exactly um, the same as trace. Uh, that's exactly the same as trace omega AM squared, which is two to the minus the Rennie two entropy. Okay, so sum of all subsets M by bulk two to the minus Rennie two entropy of subsystem AM in this bulk state, in this state omega, the state that just consists of bell pairs of maximum entangled states, one for each edge of the graph. 
So now if you have a sum like this, of course it will be dominated, right? By this uh, term that's sort of smallest because everything here will be sort of quantized multiples log of the one dimension, okay? So the question is, you know, for which, sir, uh, for which um, subset of the bulk is this term minimized? And actually what maybe you could ask before that, you could ask what's the interpretation? What is actually this entropy equal to? Okay. So what is the state that we have, okay? What's the state? The state is the state omega that just consists of bell pairs. It uh, just consists of maximum tangled states, right? Let's say maybe like this. Um, so it's, it's kind of, yeah, again, it's this sort of skeleton of the graph. It's just a product, tensor product of many bell pairs, one for each edge. Now there's this boundary, okay? And so, so again, what are the Hilbert spaces? They're sort of sitting here, right? These are all these Hilbert spaces, but they're not tensors, right? They're just Hilbert spaces, okay? So now what, I, what am I doing? Something appeared on my screen, interesting. Um, so now what are we doing? Well, we are computing entropy of a subsystem of this state. The subsystem always contains A. It never contains the rest of the boundary, but it contains some arbitrary part of, the, of these bulk sides, right? So maybe this, this part here, maybe this is M. Maybe this is M. So what's the entropy of AM in this picture? What is generically, or in general, what's the entropy here? So if a state that's just, you know, bell pairs according to a graph, and I look at a subset of the vertices and I compute and I ask you what is entropy in this state equal to? Well, clearly if my subsystem is everything here, well, what's entropy of maximum entangled state? It's a pure state, so if, if, if I'm looking at both systems at the same time, entropy zero. If I have not access to know of the system, entropy zero. But if I look at half of a maximum entangled state, this is the only time when I, when entropy is, uh, when, when I get a contribution to entropy, okay? So it's exactly about the edges that leave this region M. Those are the ones that contribute entropy, okay? So this term is equal to, well, log D, because that's somehow how things are quantized here, times, um, the number of edges, uh, well, let's say just the boundary of this region AM, if you want, right? So there's um, this region AM, it's this one, and then this is uh, the boundary of it, okay. So what's really going on here? We're looking at parts of our bulk. We look at the boundary of a part of the bulk, that's a co-dimension one surface, okay? So that's exactly actually implementing this homology constraint that probably Netta talked about, right? Because homology is always a boundary or something else. So what we find here, okay, maybe just to write down now the conclusion. So what we, uh, what we found here is we have a basic sum of all possible such choice of M and then you write entropy is D to the minus sort of the boundary of this, uh, of this region AM. And that's of course a cut homologous, homologous to A, okay. And so it's clear, right? Everything except for the min cut gets suppressed by a factor one over D. So the leading contribution here is equal to D to the size of the minimal cut. And then, you know, maybe there's multiple minimal cuts. So there's a little degeneracy, but everything else sort of gets suppressed as one over the, the this one dimension D, okay? Where this is the RT surface. Okay, so that's uh, maybe a, that's a bit of technical, but that's sort of a calculation one we, we could do. Are there any questions? Um, well, either about the individual step, steps or what the point was. So maybe I didn't even say why we're done. Well, we computed that uh, the trace of row A squared is basically d to the minus size of the minimal cut. And then, well, I guess we, we, I, I neglected some proportionality constants here, right? So um, that's sort of, but that's being compensated because we're dividing by the trace here. So really what, so you can trust me when I say that if trace row A squared is proportional to this number, then by taking minus logarithm of that, we get exactly size the minimal cut times log of the one dimension. Okay. So that's sort of one way. So, so basically what happened is it, it's kind of very interesting actually, right? This random tensor average led to a sort of a superposition over all cuts in the network, all surfaces, you know, all potential RT surfaces, not just the minimal one. And each RT, well, each you know, surface homologous to the boundary gave us a contribution to trace row A squared. 
but all of them were suppressed by a factor one over the bond dimension, except for the RT, well, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the minimal surfaces. So that's kind of a fun mechanism somehow. Okay. All right. Any, any questions? I'm just checking chat because some of these buttons are, for some reason, oh, here we go. So maybe we'll uh, discuss a bit, little bit what, uh, what was achieved and how it sort of fits into the bigger picture. Um, let's uh, discuss. So maybe first, uh, a first comment. So we, what did we manage to show? We managed to show that the Rainy 2 entropy uh, you know, on average um, for large bond dimensions actually satisfies the RT formula, okay? So it followed again by the sandwiching argument that, all, that also phenomenon entropy and the max entropy, well, they all satisfy this bound approximately. And that actually implies that the entanglement spectrum of the state is flat. So all entropies are basically, you know, equal to log, log dimension times the size of the, well, are given by the RT formula. And that's something that's not true in holography, okay? Because there's interesting entanglement spectrum. Uh, now it was understood recently that actually there is an analog of what's going on here in these random tensor networks in holography, and that's something called fixed area states. So fixed area states are rather states where you insert some more constrained linear gravity path integral to fix the area of the RT surface for your boundary region, and then somehow that leads basically um, uh, well it trivializes the entanglement spectrum, and then the behavior is very similar. And I guess something that that that, that well I think the community is also trying to understand is how to push this analogy further and find this very interesting problem. And very like and you know how what are sort of the observables for which you know fixed areas or generalization fixed area states sort of um, behave like random tensor networks, um, and indeed right and again that was because of what what Netta mentioned right sort of even if you have the singular boundary when you do the replica trick but the bulk is moves out by Einstein's equations and that's kind of like that's why the different Renyi sort of the, the, the bulk geometries for different Renyi parameters they're not like trivially related to to each other there's some like a non-trivial effect that leads to this non-trivial entanglement spectrum. So that's one comment. Um, maybe another comment that we could make is, maybe let's just stare again at this funny formula here and let's give it a, more, a bit of a different interpretation. Um, this expectation value of trace rho a squared that we found, I'm going to claim I can also understand this in a different way. I can think of this as the partition uh, up to this, this, uh, this uh, sort of proportionality constant that I neglected. I can actually think of this, I claim, as a partition function of a classical statistical mechanics model, okay? Um, and well, how is this model defined? Well, remember we had this like big sum right here, or just, you know, for each vertex we had, to, we had to decide, do I pick the identity or the swap term? That's kind of like in an easing model, right? Where you pick spin up or spin down at each side. How about the boundary? On the boundary, we always swap the A part and we never swap the complement of A. That's like fixing boundary conditions of our easing model. And uh, I claim that actually if, you looked at an easing model at say inverse temperature log dimension, log bond dimension with the standard easing interaction, that's exactly the same formula as we wrote here. Okay, so maybe I'll just write this down. So there's sort of, you know, there's some, you know, for each vertex, so including the boundary sides, maybe for each, well, say for each vertex, you pick a spin up or down. On A, you always pick say spin up. On A complement, you always pick spin down. And then you say something like, uh, well, e to the minus log D. Um, times uh, sort of an energy, sort of an easing energy corresponded with this, corresponding to the spin configuration, right? And that means, you know, like if you have, if you have a bond, uh, you, it, it, if the two spins are aligned, you get energy contribution zero, or if you pay energy cost zero, and if they're anti-aligned, you pay energy cost one, okay? That's exactly the same here, right? Because um, what you're really doing is you have the spin configuration, there's these domains where the spins are equal, and whenever you have a domain wall, you pay. And the domain walls in the statistical mechanic model, they correspond exactly to the RT surface or to these like cuts um, uh, in, in that we discussed before. So somehow you, uh, right, sort of, again, we have a sort of this easing model, boundary condition here say spin up, boundary condition there spin down. And then we are trying to, you know, we're asking what's the minimal energy, what's the ground state energy of such a configuration, but clearly we want to fill this domain with spin up, this domain with spin down, and then the energy cost of ground state is proportional to this. Oh, sorry, to the size of this RT surface here. Okay. And if you study this model, right, at very low temperatures, then we would expect that this partition function is dominated by that. And low temperature, of course, means high inverse temperature, but it means high bond dimension. Okay. So this is uh, basically inverse temperature 
So large one dimension limit is low temperature limit of this easing model. And then write the log of this partition function, which is kind of free energy is being dominated by the basically only contributions to ground state energy. Um, and that's another way of thinking about this. And it's very uh, uh, a good way of thinking about it because it, it, it basically leads uh, very directly to generalization um, to say higher you know, Rennie entropies and sort of other kind of expectation values. If instead of looking at some quadratic expression here, if you looked at say, you know, an nth Rennie entropy, well, what would happen, it turns out that, you know, you know that the replica trick um, in that case, you know, instead of swapping, you have a cyclic permutation, you're like gluing together the replica in some staircase fashion. So you would again get a statistical mechanics model, but now the degrees of freedom are permutations. On one side, you have say a cyclic permutation, on the other side, you have an identity permutation and the cost associated with a, an edge is somehow the difference between the two permutations measured in some natural metric, just some the number of swaps needed to go from each other. So maybe I just wanna say, um, uh, this is sort of an extremely natural generalization. Uh, to uh, yeah, to say uh, you know, say higher replica tricks. I mean, in the sense of you know, more than two replicas. Let's say more than two replicas. More than two replicas. Okay, um, I think I should uh, wrap up slowly. Maybe in the next uh, five minutes. Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's do that. And so maybe just to say, I mean, why would you ever want to look at more than two replicas if you know the entanglement spectrum is flat? There's other interesting questions you can ask your quantum state, right? For example, you can look at, um, you could ask, okay, right now we already only looked at entropy, right? Entropy is kind of measuring the entanglement between A and A complement. You could also be interested in say the entanglement between two subsystems, A and B, but they don't cover the whole boundary. So the reduced state of A, B is not pure. So let's say, right, there's sort of, a, B, and then the rest. And you're interested in quantifying the entanglement between A and B. Now, if Patrick would have had time to talk about mixed state entanglement, he might have introduced to you, to you various measures, various ways of measuring this entanglement. Um, so for example, um, there's something called the reflected entropy, but that's one way of doing it. There's something else called the entanglement negativity. And, uh, and then there's a bunch of other measures that are really hard to compute, okay? But say for this entanglement negativity, one can use similar replica tricks, but now sort of these um, kind of, uh, it's sort of a more interesting quantity than this one. So it corresponds to some, you know, interesting expectation value where you're doing one permutation on one part of the boundary, some other permutation on another part of the boundary and so on. And then somehow it's really useful to have the statistical mechanical intuition, right? Where you, you can just think of this as a classical statmac model, just a, say permutation boundary conditions here, other here, other there. And you can sort of try to guess your way towards, you know, understanding the, well, by understanding sort of the low energy physics of this completely classical model, you will sort of understand, you know, the, the basically the, the um, uh, behavior of these of these quantities in the quantum mechanical tensor network model and this random tensor network model. So I would say so the appeal of this random tensor network model is that you can really basically, you can compute lots of things by reducing them to classical, I mean, non-trivial, but classical questions about, you know, permutations, uh, permutation models, sort of generalized easing models. Okay. So that's one thing um, where one could talk about a lot more. Another thing that I guess is this picture that I keep moving downwards is how about, I mean, going beyond states. I just spent, I guess, the entire lecture talking about states. Ideally, I would have liked to talk for 10 or 15 minutes, uh, actually, you know, by about codes, about, you know, ways of actually mapping bulk to boundary. So we saw this yesterday in the three Qtrid code where we mapped one bulk degree of freedom to a, a three side boundary. Now we have tensor networks. Of course, we can just combine both, right? And combining both would be like in this picture if you ignore these uh, shaded regions. Right, so what we're doing here is uh, we have the same tensor network structures before, but now at each bulk side, we're adding an input. Okay, so now this picture corresponds, right? That's maybe, uh, I guess it's, I hope it's clear, but maybe it's still weird. So maybe I, let me just take a copy of this one. Um, the expense of running over time a minute or two. So this is this, this, this thing defined a state, right? We discussed this before. So now the only thing I'm doing is I'm, I'm adding new legs here at each bulk side. Every bulk side, I'm going to add one leg. And now I have a tensor that has bulk and boundary degrees of freedom. And such a tensor I can think of as a linear map, as a mapping from bulk to boundary degrees of freedom in the same way as in the three Q-tree toy model. And I could ask, you know, what, what kind of properties does it satisfy? 
does it satisfy properties that we hope or expect from holography or does it not satisfy those? And again, one can do this in this happy model under some assumptions or one can do it with random tensors, okay? Um, and so for example, you could ask about, you know, this uh, uh, subregion duality question, right? And what does that does mean? This meant that it should be possible. Now we come back, come to the second picture. Um, it should be possible, right? The claim of subregion duality is that if you look at a, de at a degree of freedom inside this entanglement wedge here, it should be possible to reconstruct it from this boundary here. Right? And you could try to prove this again by sort of orienting arrows. If you oriented the arrows, somehow that would, um, what would that correspond to? That would be a bit like you have the left part of the network, you have the right part of the network, you have this entanglement according to the RT cut, but now you have two inputs, right? You have the input corresponding to entanglement wedge and to the complement the output on the A boundary and on the complement. So now again, you know, if L and R were unitaries then or isometries, then you could decode the entanglement wedge from this output. So that's one way of doing it. The other is by computing entropy and, um, uh, and, and using this decoupling uh, uh, story that Patrick mentioned, I think maybe in his last lecture. So that's one thing one could talk about. Um, and I think that's, of course, I mean, that would have been nice to end on that and, and with a bit more time. Um, somehow, uh, Maybe just to give you a glimpse, I mean, I, I guess I wasted a lot of time talking about this particular calculation. Um, the beautiful thing about this calculation that we spent time on is that it did not depend at all on the geometry of the object we looked at. So now you can do, for example, the following things. You can treat this object, this linear map, you can think of as a quantum state, and you can compute actually entropies of things like an entropy of some bulk legs. Right? So for example, to show that this entire thing defines a map, an isometry from bulk to boundary, the only thing I would have to do is I would have to compute the entropy of the bulk legs. And this I can do using Yuri Taganagi. And Yuri Taganagi would tell me, well, I just have to find a minimal cut, cutting, you know, separating the bulk from the boundary. And then there's, you know, there's like sort of the area, there's, I can cut sort of here at the side, or I can sort of chop off each bulk leg individually and so on and so forth. And, you know, one can think about this, but the key point is like all these like information theoretic questions, we can now basically answer by just drawing pictures and by you know, cutting through our geometry and so on. So one can precisely understand when does subregion duality hold. Uh, one can also you know, talk about corrections to the entropy, about generalized entropy formula, you know, islands, sort of toy versions of these islands that you heard about and so on and so forth. So that's one thing. Um, um, maybe I'll just say some other keywords um, and then I'll sort of wrap up if, if, if Tom allows. Um, <laughs> Um, sure, that's good. Yeah. I just want, yeah, I just want to mention maybe a few things that we didn't have time to discuss and I wasn't planning on discussing, but it would have been nice to talk about, right? Um, so one is sort of this whole like uh, error correction story in, more, in much more detail. So um, in which sense are Ryo Takenagi actually related to say subregion duality and so on? That's a very nice story there. Uh, something else is this thing we discussed last, uh, I guess yesterday in the Q&A, sort of superpositions of geometries. Does that, can one model and incorporate those into the network? Um, how about Hamiltonians, right? Can we, is there like a consistent way of having a bulk, you know, sort of, sort of effective Hamiltonian in the bulk, let's say local, and also a dual Hamiltonian on the boundary that's also local. That's not at all obvious, but that's something people have studied recently. Um, then one, yeah, one can uh, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, we can talk about things like generous entropy formulas and its subtleties and, and, and so on, entangled measures and so on. So these are just like a bunch of things. So I think there's lots that we don't understand about these models. Uh, but I hope it was still sort of fun. So I guess uh, that was, uh, yeah, it was my last lecture. So um, hopefully it came together a little bit, right? So the, so this idea of tensor networks, right? Building quantum states based on geometry together with this, you know, error correction idea, um, sort of an, as, a, as a sort of a means of building nice, nice little toy models. I heard that Brian mentioned um, random circuits the other day and said, you know, you all should do the calculation yourself. Maybe I guess I did maybe a, a toy version of that for you. So maybe that helps to get started. Um, all right. So yeah, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll shut up now. So thanks. Thanks a lot. And are there any questions? Thanks, Michael. Um, okay. Uh, maybe we can take a few quick questions. Um, we have a Q and A scheduled for Monday. Um, and hopefully Michael will join us for that at, at 9 a.m. So you can um, ask more, more questions then, but let's, let's take a few quick questions now and then we can break.
So the, the, this last fact that you mentioned about proving that it's an isometry, mm -hmm. um, you, you sort of, you do that, it's an average statement, right? Um, as in it's a proxy, it's a, an isometry on average, is that, is that right? Or... Um, yeah, hmm. so I think, yeah, I think, good, yeah, good question. I mean, so all these things that we proved in average, they do hold with high probability. But it's but the entropies are approximately, you know, uh, equal to the RT formula. And I guess there's some subtlety. And you know, um, if I have a uh, a quantum state that's almost maximally entangled, how close it is it is it is it to a unitary? You know, say operator norm or something. So somehow there's some technicalities around this. But everything that we proved here on average, you will also be able to show with high probability. So that's not necessarily an issue. Uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a pretty General question. Sure. What was the, uh, you were talking about? But it's is there a feature where these um, this tensor network reconstruction of the bulk encoding of the bulk is related to holographic complexity? I was thinking to something like if you evolve in time, maybe the boundary state that would include like an, uh, like higher number of vertices in the in the bulk, and I wanted to know if the state becomes more complex. And so if I wanted to know if maybe that can be related in some way to holographic complexity or if anyone tried to do that already. Mm. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, so, so one, I think one sort of interesting factor. So I guess I had the story before, like, you know, when, um, um, yeah, when, you know, when, when so in the situation where we have a, say this RT surface here, right? Then you can sort of orient these tensors such that they're unitary and so on. And that sort of says that, you know, I mean, yeah. So, so that's okay. So that's one situation. You could also have a situation that you're say, um, uh, say two RT surfaces. And then, so the stuff in between can be unitary kind of because it goes up and goes down again in, in size. Um, and non-unitary evolutions are harder than unitary ones. So I think there's some story there. This is like Python slum story that, that some people have worked on. I think there's, that's, I think basically a relation that one could, could explore. So I think there is sort of, um, I guess there's maybe heuristically one can sort of maybe understand sort of these kind of bottlenecks and tensor networks with some increase in complexity. I'm not sure I can say a super sharp statement there. I think in general, like what's really missing in all of these toy models are some like, I mean, especially if you want, if you want to see not, you know, if you don't want to just quantify complexity of a single state, but say see something evolving, I think none of these toy models really have an, any dynamics attached to them. So that's a bit uh, unsatisfying, right? I mean, you one could sort of hold maybe a picture where kind of you go from one time slice to another by sort of evolving your network, uh, maybe by, you know, I guess naively, maybe you would apply some kind of time evolution network and then you compress again in some geometric way. But I think that there's no model that really captures this as far as I'm aware. So maybe sort of slice by slice, you could draw an analogy, but relating the slices, I don't think there's any like nice model that, that people know. Um, so that would be really, really nice to have actually. Okay. Actually, I guess related to this question of dynamics. So I guess I'm still kind of confused about why people believe that you should be able to have local time evolution. Cause it seems like um, the way you get locality is like you fix this background and then you put your Bulk degrees of freedom on top of it, but um, if you want like true time evolution, you have to like evolve this background too, right? And then you get non-locality. So like, yeah, I guess why do we expect that we should be able to model local evolution? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say because say say on the CFT side, your time evolution is somehow quasi-local or something, right? And then uh, maybe effectively you can describe what's going on in your bulk to some extent, right? Maybe for some time. Uh, certainly by in, in some local way. So somehow, th so the idea of the question there would be to find, so what do you want actually? You would like say a, a, a say local Hamiltonian of the bulk, and then maybe you would like to construct another local Hamiltonian the boundary, which on the code subspace acts the same way or approximately the same way. So I think that would sort of reflect maybe what one, the expectations. And that's something that people uh, I th achieved recently in, in some situations. Um, yeah, actually also say, well, both with the sort of an upgrade to the happy model, I think in higher dimensions and also to random tensors. Um, so yeah, so, so that, that, that's sort of very non-obvious, right? Because some of we, I guess we, well, we didn't discuss, but we, we saw this in the, in the model, right? When you, um, 
you can sort of take an opera a local operator and, and, and at, at a bulk site and then you could push it out to the boundary but of course the further in you start the less local it is on the boundary um, so if you just say naively took a local Hamiltonian sort of on your you know on this effective uh, you know bulk field theory that's kind of corresponding to these red legs so I mean I'm just saying words right what I mean is I just take local Hamiltonian on this bulk Hilbert space corresponding to these red legs imagine these red legs they're like qubits they're like really it's some effective description it's like so few degrees of freedom, so low energy. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't impact your bulk. Like it's not like you're 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 you're, you're creating any significant background or something. Um, then somehow, if you pushed out, say, a, say a two local term here to the boundary, right, it would sort of grow in size. And it's not clear that you can sort of truncate or sort of, you know, maybe it, maybe you can look at the density of the, you know, how maybe maybe the non-local terms are there. There's few of them than there's local ones right? because um and these so this kind of analysis people have done in a certain scenario and they there's like some tricks on Hamiltonian complexity that they use to actually show that you can write you can find an equivalent uh quasi local I think uh boundary Hamiltonian for any local bulk Hamiltonian in those models mostly just based on uh, I mean the, the only input is really the subregion duality actually it's not like you don't need any any other fine tuning no, I think right could I ask something? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm a bit confused in the random tensor network model. If we average over all the tensors, then how do we create different states in the boundary? Or is that possible in this model? It seems like you you only get one state if you're if you're oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. Everything. Yeah. So it's a bit unfortunate that I, I spent uh, too much of today just talking about states, like here. Um, right? I mean that the same would be true in this happy model, right? If I if, if I don't have any, yeah, if I if I start with a network like this, I just get a single state, right? Once for each choice of tensors. Yeah. Or if you know if you choose them at random, you get an ensemble of states. But somehow everything we discussed was, was true basically for a single realization. Mm -hmm. Some of the, um, the the thing I very uh, quickly said at the end or towards the end, right, was that we can sort of upgrade these models both the happy model and I mean that was really what they what they achieved, as well as the random tensor network model by adding to each tensor an auxiliary leg, an auxiliary leg that's now dangling in the bulk. And so now it's still in, our, in random tensors, you would pick all of these as random tensors, but now they have, you know, each of them has this additional leg. And then their claim would be if you, you picked say all these tensors at random, and now you've picked, you, you've picked them, then this thing defines a linear map that satisfies these properties that we would expect or hope from holography with high probability. So, you know, picking all these tensors gives you not just a boundary state, it gives you a linear map from bulk to boundary. So like a whole dictionary. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And is it possible to count how many boundary states you would have? And then um, in some well, sense yeah. say that only a small fraction of them have a geometrical bulk or something like that? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Actually, and, and somehow, right? So, so it's really the question, how large can you the, can you pick these these dimensions these bulk dimensions such that this 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 uh, tensor still defines an isometry so you know a, an encoding from bulk to boundary and one one uh, sort of you know necessary constraint is of course that the bulk Hilbert space dimension is less or equal to boundary Hilbert space dimension and say negative curvature that's sort of okay like if this was flat space it would be weird mm -hmm. right because the bulk is sort of this uh, volume law on the bound so it would still work but you would have you would have to pick those dimensions much smaller so but imagine these are say qubits or something low dimensional and then all the all the in-plane bonds they are really high dimensional then it would still be that sort of you know even in say flat space uh, sort of this uh, volume law associated to the qubits would be beaten by the area law uh, of the other guy, sorry, the other yeah would beat the array law. Yeah, so sort of um, if you yeah maybe um, yes, so so kind of the way you uh, you you show this in happy is again you by trying to orient these tensors in such a way that you actually see that you have an isometry now from bulk legs plus RT surface to the boundary, and that's possible sometimes under some assumptions. How you would do it in random tensor networks is you would sort of treat this entire thing as a state and the state is now, now a state that has bulk as well as boundary indices. And now you would compute the entropy of the bulk part. And because Rio Takanagi holds in random tensor networks, you can just do this geometrically. So you could ask what is the minimal way of cutting um, uh, the tensor network in, a, in such a way that it separates all these bulk legs from all the boundary legs. 
And again, there's basically these two choices, right? These two extreme choices. Either you just chop off all these legs, that would correspond to log, you know, say of this red dimension times the size of the bulk. And the other choice would be you cut sort of here, right? You cut sort of all the boundary legs. That would be log of this um, other big, bigger dimension times the size of the boundary. Okay. And so if this guy wins, you have an isometry. Mm -hmm. If that guy wins, actually, you have an isometry the wrong way around. Um, so, you, I mean, you can you can choose both, right? You can also choose this one and then say, oh, let's again look at a small subspace of the bulk. That's a bit by direction codes Annie mentioned yesterday. But sort of in the simplest case, you would kind of like this this one to be the minimal one of the two. And then you would have proof that you have an isometry. You, know, you really have a good encoding, encoding from an encoding of bulk to boundary. And you didn't have to you didn't have to do any you know random tensor calculation. You can just like leverage Ryotakenagi of this uh, joint bulk boundary state. And you can similarly, yeah, you can similarly think about subregion duality and also just just by computing entropy. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, let's let's finish there. Um, and uh,